I'm Nancy Leffert. I'm the president of Antioch University Santa Barbara, and it's really my pleasure to welcome all of you. Today's forum is being sponsored by the Antioch University Santa Barbara's Board of Trustees, who along with our Antioch administration and faculty are committed to presenting topics to the community that have vital importance to, to all sectors. I want to especially thank tonight our wonderful trustee Susan Rose. There she is. <laughs> who, as you all know, um, is a former uh, county supervisor, and she ch chairs our trustee forum committee. And so I want to thank her particularly for her thoughtful planning of this event. And I want to thank trustee Lou Cannon, former Los Angeles bureau chief for the Washington Post, who has written extensively and objectively about health care reform and who helped to shape today's pre presentation. As everyone is aware, critical questions about how we will manage healthcare as a nation, state, and local community are really front burner issues, not only for healthcare providers, but these issues confront all individuals and families. It is a topic of interest to our Antioch students, all of whom are required to do community service as part of their curriculum. Many do internships in agencies and organizations that help families at risk. Our students are acutely aware of the catastrophic impact that illness can bring to an individual or a family, and particularly those who are without insurance or with inadequate insurance. Our graduates often go on to work or to run agencies and organizations where they continue to care for the needs of the most vulnerable in our community, and some of them are here tonight, some of our graduates. This evening's forum will be broadcast on both our website to benefit our entire student body, as well as on Channel 21 for the community. Now, to introduce today's speakers, and panelists, it's my extreme pleasure to introduce to you our chair of the Antioch Board of Trustees, Vicki Riskin. Well, this is a wonderful turnout, and thank you all for coming. Um, tonight at Antioch University Santa Barbara, we're privileged to have the State Insurance Commissioner, Dave Jones and a distinguished panel to discuss the exciting opportunity and challenge facing California as it seeks to implement the Affordable Care Act that President Obama signed into law in 2010, if you haven't heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> Our panelists are key leaders in the health community in Santa Barbara. Kurt Ransahoff, MD, Chief Medical Director of Sansom Clinic. Dr. Cinder Sinclair, Executive Director, the Santa Barbara Neighborhood Clinics. <laughs> Dr. Takashi Wada, Director of the Santa Barbara County Public Health Department, Dr. Wada. <laughs> and the incomparable Ron Werft, the CEO and President of Cottage Hospital System. Uh, I want to personally thank you so much for coming and being with us today. The law that we're discussing, usually called the ACA, makes the most fundamental changes in the nation's medical system since the advent of Medicare in 1965. It aims to improve medical practices, reduce costs, and ensure 32 million of 50 million Americans who lack the sort of health insurance that they need. Seven million of these uninsured persons live in California, about one-seventh of the total in the nation. Um, the health insurance attempts to expand in America through a combination of efforts, uh, Medicaid, that federal state program that provides health care for the poor, and the creation of new online marketplaces called exchanges in which people will be able to shop for affordable 
health insurance policies in a competitive environment that hopefully will reduce costs. Our speaker tonight will help us assess the prospects of these exchanges. What happens in California is critical. So far, only 15 of the 50 states have created their own exchanges, either through state legislation or executive order by governors. California was the first state to implement the legislation after the ACA became law, and the California Health Benefits Exchange, which has a very capable director and a bipartisan board, is regarded as the most advanced in the nation. In the entertainment business, there's a saying that if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. When it comes to implementation, however, the eyes of the nation are on California with its high technology and remarkable diversity. California was the leader in smog control. Detroit said that it couldn't and wouldn't equip cars uh, with emission-reducing catalytic converters. After California required them, the industry said it could and it now does. California was also the first state to implement Medicaid. The ACA has also already brought about important changes. Children under 19 can no longer be denied insurance coverage due to an existing medical condition. In 2014, this benefit will be extended to everyone. New policies written in 2012 can no longer impose lifetime limits on health benefits, a provision of great importance to the chronically ill. But the most significant change will come on January 1, 2014, when states begin operating these exchanges on which affordable health care policies will be offered. Plans for these exchanges are supposed to be submitted to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services next month although it's obvious that the majority of states will not meet that deadline. California, however, is ready to move ahead, and what is done here will be eagerly watched for clues by other states and federal government. We look forward to hearing a progress report from the State Commissioner, Dave Jones, and he is prepared to answer some tough questions from our medical providers in the community and from the audience. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Dave Jones. Well, thank you very much. It's a real treat to be back in Santa Barbara, and I want to begin by thanking Board Chair Riskin and President Leffert, and also my friend Susan Rose for inviting me to attend this forum, and thank Antioch for hosting this wonderful forum and having such an illustrious panel. Um, Ron and I have had a chance to work together. Not only is he a tremendous, tremendous executive and leader of your hospital system, but he's a past president of the California Hospital Association, and uh, we were able to work together on an important piece of legislation that I authored with the California Hospital Association sponsorship that's resulted in about $7 billion in net new additional funding for safety net hospitals like Cottage to make sure they are more adequately reimbursed. I won't say completely reimbursed, but more adequately reimbursed for the Medi-Cal population they take. So it's a great treat to be on a panel with such an illustrious group of medical providers. Uh, we are, uh, as was mentioned a moment ago, hard at work right now implementing the Affordable Care Act in California. And I think we are in the lead nationwide, and we have uh, taken upon ourselves the role of being the leading state, and happily so. Uh, I just want to quickly walk through some of the immediate benefits of the Affordable Care Act that Santa Barbarans and Californians in general and Americans across the nation are enjoying. And then I'll talk a little bit about what happens in 2014 with the establishment of the Health Benefits Exchange. And then I'll close by talking about one of the missing elements of the Affordable Care Act that I've been working with others to try to fill. So immediate benefits. You know, there's a lot of um, misapprehension uh, confusion and, and downright uh, misinformation going on about what's in the Affordable Care Act. First, it's not socialism. It's actually a market-based reform that emanated from a series of conservative think tanks, and it was championed by Mitt Romney, the current Republican nominee for the presidency when he was governor in 2005 in Massachusetts. And so uh, President uh, uh, Candidate Romney actually uh, championed 
the Affordable Care Act in Massachusetts and was successful in getting it enacted there. Uh, what is in it? Well, one of the most important components is a requirement that health insurers and HMOs actually spend a larger share of the premium dollar that we pay as individuals or families or employers or labor unions, the premium dollar we pay to them, a larger share go to actual health care to pay medical providers like those that are on stage and others as well. And here, I think it's interesting to pause a moment. What you and I call medical care, that is uh, treatment and reimbursement for treatment by physicians and nurses and hospitals and clinics and other medical providers, the health insurers and the HMOs have another term for. They call that a medical loss. And they actually have a fancy calculation, hang with me here, called the medical loss ratio, in which they calculate the percentage of every dollar they collect from us in premium that actually goes to pay medical providers like doctors and nurses and hospitals and other clinicians. And so it wasn't too long ago in the state of California, for example, that Anthem Blue Cross of California had a medical loss ratio of 60% which means that 60 cents on every dollar they collected in premium they put into health care and the other 40 cents they kept for themselves. And when you just sit back and think about that for a moment, it, it's striking. Uh, the good news is, and one of the most important elements of the Affordable Care Act, uh, is that now uh, that requirement has been changed dramatically so that up to 85 cents on the dollar has to go to actual health care in the large group market, 80 cents on the dollar in the individual and small group health insurance markets. And that's a big deal. And it's such a big deal that the night I was sworn in as your new insurance commissioner on January 3rd, 2011, I issued an emergency regulation right then and there to enforce that requirement here in California because I thought it was absolutely essential that we move forward with that in California. Now here's another interesting facet of that requirement though. If the health insurers and the HMOs don't meet that requirement, they're then obligated to rebate the underage, if you will, back to consumers. And so in August, I oversaw the rebating of about $79 million to 1.2 million Californians. These aren't huge checks. Uh, on average, maybe about 100 bucks or so, some as high as 1,000 bucks. I've had people chase me down the street, pull a check out of their wallet, and wave it, and say, Commissioner, thank you. And I say, you know, don't thank me, thank Obamacare, because it's a critically important element of the law. Some other immediate benefits that we're enjoying right now, and you heard a, a moment ago some of them. You can keep your kids on your health insurance till age 26. That's benefiting 350,000 young people in California today. The elimination of lifetime caps in health insurance and HMO products. You know, there are 12 million Californians that have health insurance with a provision called a lifetime cap that limits the total amount of coverage they can get for any illness. So let me just share with you one story to illustrate this. A friend of mine, a young woman named Paula Velasquez, who's 24 years of age, she was diagnosed with a very rare form of cancer about two years ago a cancer that requires her to spend, or someone to spend, $60,000 per chemotherapy treatment to keep her alive. Her total course of treatment to keep her alive, $1 million, a life-threatening form of cancer. Now, she had insurance, and happily so, one of the lucky Californians with it, but she had a lifetime cap in her insurance product that limited her coverage to $400,000, and yet she needed a $1 million of treatment, and that was the actual cost associated with the treatment to keep her alive. Thanks to Obamacare, she is alive because Obamacare eliminates those lifetime caps for 12 million Californians that have them. She got the treatment she needed. Uh, thankfully, the cancer is in remission, and she's leading a very, very active life. And she's not alone. I can't tell you the number of physicians, other clinicians, and patients I've met throughout the state in my travels who are in a similar circumstance. Now, another really great benefit of Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act is it's no longer a pre-existing condition to be a woman in the United States. And I think that's a good thing. I think we can agree that's a good thing. Um, and let me explain. Uh, what Obamacare does is it eliminates certain co-insurance and co-payment requirements for women's preventative health, um, including services provided by Planned Parenthood and other important women's health clinics. Um, and so that's a very, very positive thing because we want more women to go in and get preventative care and not be facing a hurdle or barrier in terms of a co-payment or other costs. So that's a very positive thing. Children. The Federal Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, eliminates the ability of HMOs or health insurers to deny children health insurance based on pre-existing condition. That's a tremendously important thing in California and throughout the nation. Seniors. Uh, how many folks here, well, I don't know if you want to confess it or not, but just out of, if you feel comfortable confessing, how many folks here are, are, are on Medicare right now? All right. And how many folks here hope to get to the point that you're on Medicare, right? Everybody else. <laughs> you know, everybody else. Absolutely. 
And so there's that point in the Medicare prescription drug benefit where you fall into what's called the donut hole, where your coverage runs out and you have to dig into your pocket for thousands of dollars to cover the prescription medications you need to stay alive. Thanks to Obamacare, the Federal Affordable Care Act, that donut hole is closed. Seniors were entitled to a rebate in the first year. The second year, they're entitled to discounted drugs that reduce their cost by 50%. And over time, the donut hole gets eliminated in its entirety. Small businesses, many small businesses want to provide health insurance for their employees, but it's awfully expensive for them to do it, and many can't afford it, which helps explain why we have 7 million Californians right now without health insurance. There's a federal tax credit of 35% to defray the cost of providing health insurance for small businesses. So this is just a partial list of some of the really important immediate benefits that we're enjoying right now here in California and across the nation because of Obamacare, because of the Federal Affordable Care Act. And I spend as much time on them with you because I think there's been a lot of misinformation put out there about what's in the act. And I think a lot of folks aren't aware, not this audience, this is obviously a very, very attentive audience, but other audiences in the greater public are not aware of the benefits that are there. And I think it's important to remind ourselves of them because they are truly, truly important. And were we to lose them, it would be a tremendous step back. Now, what's coming in the future? In 2014, we turn on the switch for the new health benefits exchange. And this is something that we've been working hard on. I, as your insurance commissioner, the new health benefits exchange authority board, which is a bipartisan board, uh, the Brown administration and the Obama administration working together to stand up this exchange. What is this exchange? It's essentially an online marketplace where individuals and small businesses will be able to go and shop for health insurance and HMO product in a more transparent and understandable right way. Right now, for any of you who have gone out into the market yourself, as either a business owner or manager or individual, good luck. It's hard to compare products on apples to apples. The policy terms are so opaque, it's hard to figure out what they mean. Even when you end up in a product, it ends up not doing the things you thought it was going to do, even though it was explained to you repeatedly by a number of people. What the new law requires is that every health insurer and every HMO that's selling product in the exchange will first have to meet a minimum floor of benefits called the essential health benefits. And this is both for product in the exchange and outside the exchange. What's the benefit of the essential health benefits benchmark? It establishes a floor below which insurers cannot go in terms of essential coverage. It eliminates junk insurance, the kind of insurance that seems to cover you, but upon closer inspection really doesn't, has huge deductibles, huge co-payments, and you end up paying premiums for something that really doesn't do you any good. So it sets a floor, and California and all of the states that are participating in the Affordable Care Act got to identify where they wanted to put that floor. We did that uh, through a bill that Governor Brown signed earlier this year, and we've established that floor. Second. Every health insurer and HMO that's selling in exchange has to offer a hierarchy of four products. They're called metal level, bronze, silver, gold, platinum. And at each of these levels, there are different levels of coinsurance that are afforded to one. At the lowest level, you'd end up paying 30% coinsurance. At the highest level, 0% coinsurance. At each of those levels, every health insurer and HMO has to offer a standardized product that allows you to compare across all health insurers and HMOs based on price. So you can do an apples to apples comparison in each of these levels that will then allow you to decide what makes sense for you from a cost effectiveness standpoint and a coverage standpoint. So it's a market based reform. It's a reform about transparency. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the health benefits exchange in California is going to be an active purchaser of health insurance and HMO product. What we're going to do is basically accumulate the buying power of the three to four million Californians that will be eligible to purchase in the exchange and use that to hopefully negotiate better prices from the health insurers and the HMOs. So that also shall help to bend the price curve down. Now, the Affordable Care Act has a lot of other provisions in it um, that go to medical providers that are designed to try to encourage more primary care physicians, encourage more coordinated care, encourage medical homes, a whole host of other things which I'm happy to talk about in further detail or frankly these experts may be better suited to talk about uh, as we move to the panel part of the presentation. But there's also another tremendously important feature of the Affordable Care Act, and that is it gives states the option to expand their Medicaid program. What does that mean for California? The expansion afforded under the Affordable Care Act allows us to actually insure single adults for the first time. Uh, at a slightly higher level of income than historically has been the case. What that means is 1.9 million additional Californians who are part of the 7 million uninsured will now be eligible for Medi-Cal if we take the feds up on this deal. And what a deal it is. Because for the first four or five years, the feds pick up 100% of that cost. 
dropping down to 90% of the cost in about 2020. So even at the far end of that deal, they still end up paying 90%. Right now, as the medical providers can tell you, the feds only pick up about 50 cents on every dollar uh, that's spent on Medi-Cal. The state has to pick up, I'm sorry, I stand corrected. We end up picking up about 70 cents on every dollar. The feds only pick up 30 cents on the dollar. Other states have the better deal where it's 50-50. So we end up, our state share of Medi-Cal is higher, or conversely, the federal reimbursement for Medi-Cal is one of the lowest in the nation. This expanded cohort of individuals will be able to cover under Medi-Cal. Much better deal, 100% federal coverage, dwindling only to 90% um, coverage, which is a great, great deal for California. Now, what does that mean for all the rest of us who may not be Medi-Cal eligible? It means that 1.9 million people that are currently getting care when they're really, really sick, when it's really affordable to treat them, and they're in our emergency rooms, just as they're at a cottage hospital, we're, we're obligated to provide them care, but it's a lot more expensive. It means we'll get them into insurance and no longer shift those costs to private pairs of insurance or to other programs or force hospitals to eat those costs. It's a part of the overall Affordable Care Act and why it's so important to get folks insured because we can essentially stop a big part of the cost shifting that's occurring right now that's eating us alive. There was a study done by the Bay Area Council, which is a, a business trade association in the Bay Area, that determined that with the Affordable Care Act, we can, we're going to create probably about 100,000 new jobs, mostly in the medical provider and healthcare space, um, and a tremendous amount of additional economic activity. So I think it's a great deal. It's a great deal for California. It's a great deal for Californians. Let me close by just touching lightly on one of the missing pieces of the Affordable Care Act. Regrettably, what the Affordable Care Act doesn't have in it is direct authority to reject excessive health insurance and HMO prices. And I say regrettably because Diane Feinstein fought really hard to try to get that in the Affordable Care Act, but she was blocked in doing that. And I've been fighting at the state level through state legislation to give the insurance commissioner that authority, but we've been blocked in the state legislature as well. I say regrettably because I think without that authority, although the Affordable Care Act will help to bend the price curve down a bit, we won't get as much relief from rate increases as we otherwise would. And the new individual mandate associated with the Affordable Care Act is going to so empower the health insurers and the HMOs that even with the um, cumulative ability to negotiate on behalf of people that the exchange will have, that will be washed out to some extent and prices will continue to go up. And I cite you two data points for this. First, CalPERS. CalPERS is the largest large group purchaser of health insurance and HMO product in the state of California. And you would think if anybody could get a good deal, CalPERS would. But frankly, CalPERS just announced the other month a 9.6% average rate increase for their folks. And so if even the largest of large groups continues to be unable to really co control the cost of health care, I think that suggests there are going to be real limits on the ability of the exchange to do so too. Second, Massachusetts again. Massachusetts did adopt under Mitt Romney in 2005 the Affordable Care Act, an individual mandate, a requirement that the insurers provide insurance for everybody regardless of pre-existing condition, and a subsidized pool or a health benefits exchange where individuals and businesses could go to buy the product. And the hope was all those things would work together to bend the price curve down didn't quite happen that way. Prices continue to go up in the health benefits exchange. Three years later, new governor Deval Patrick was shoveling money out of the general fund of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts into the exchange to keep up with the price increases, decided this is crazy, directed his insurance commissioner to start regulating health insurance prices. And so two data points for why I think this is really the missing piece and why Diane Feinstein also thinks this is the missing piece of the Affordable Care Act. How do we fill this missing piece? Unlikely to do so at the federal level. We've tried it unsuccessfully at the state legislative level. So what I've done over the last eight months is work with a consumer coalition to collect 800,000 signatures on a ballot measure that will be on the ballot in November 2014 to give the insurance commissioner the authority to reject excessive rate hikes. An authority I have, I might, have, I might add, since 1988, insurance commissioners have had the authority to reject excessive rate hikes for auto, homeowners, property, and casualty insurance. In the 18 months I've been your insurance commissioner, I I've saved folks $541 million in premiums they would otherwise pay, but I don't have that authority for health insurance. 34 other states have given their insurance commissioners this authority. It's not radical. It's not new. We're behind the curve. We ought to do it. And let me close just by um, acknowledging uh, my dear friend and former colleague and soon-to-be Senate colleague, Hannah Beth Jackson, who is delightful to see. And I can't wait till she's back in the Capitol, um, and also another great friend and a tremendous leader, Salud Carbajal, who's doing a great job on the Board of Supervisors. Great to see you too, soon. So you got a lot of uh, really smart, thoughtful people here. I'm sorry I talked so fast, um, but there's a lot to get through, and you've got a great panel, so I'm uh, happy to step aside, and however you'd like to 
uh, take questions, I'm happy to do it. Ah, I'm going to start. Um, well, I am uniquely qualified to be anxious because <laughs> I am uh, both a practicing physician. Oh, sorry, here you go. Even more qualified. <laughs> um, I, uh, I feel uniquely qualified to be anxious about this legislation because I am uh, both a practitioner, I have my own patients, some of whom are in the room, and I'm also the CEO of Sansom Clinic, a large organization. So the health, the changes that are coming, I think I will feel both on a personal level as an actual practicing doctor and as an administrator. Uh, a question that I have when you were talking about the cost curve and bending it. If you limit the medical loss ratio, then it seems as if the premiums will go up only because actually the cost of care goes up. So how do you control the cost of care? Is it through regulating the rate that's paid or regulating or somehow trying to change provider and patient behavior? And maybe you could talk about the challenges of each of those. So th there are several things going on at once, um, as your question alludes to. Uh, number one, um, there are increases in underlying medical costs. And the Department of Labor um, has an annual statistic. They look at uh, actual underlying medical costs, not health insurance, not HMO costs, but actual medical costs. And the inflation rate is between 3 or 4% per year. So it's true, medical costs are going up, and in some markets going up at an even significantly higher rate than that. So that's one phenomenon. Second, health insurers and HMOs are dramatically increasing their rates as well, some of which is driven by medical costs going up, but a sizable portion of which is driven by their desire to get higher returns for their owners or operators or higher margin if they're a nonprofit. Let me give you an example. Anthem Blue Cross made a 26% return on equity in 2010. Now remember, in 2010, we were still at the height of the greatest recession since the Great Depression. I don't know of any other industry, maybe other than the oil industry, that was making a 26% return on equity. Mind you, return on equity. Um, huge, huge returns, and they're, and they're not unique. So the reform that I've talked about, uh, which is designed to try to bend a portion of the price curve down, is really directed at these higher returns and administrative costs of the health insurers and the HMOs. Um, it doesn't go to the underlying medical costs. Uh, the Affordable Care Act seeks to get at that through a whole host of different innovations, um, some experimental, uh, some uh, less experimental and more systemic. What are those? Um, uh, uh, accountable care organizations, which are sort of like HMOs, uh, you know, for us it's not entirely novel, but uh, funding um, coordinated care uh, where uh, health insurers and providers uh, have uh, some skin in the game and essentially they're given a capitated rate for the health of the patient and they're rewarded to the extent they keep the patient healthy. So the Affordable Care Act has a push like that. The Affordable Care Act does some things with regard to trying to push more coordinated care. Uh, it encourages and helps to fund uh, providers to use electronic medical records to try to reduce errors. Um, it pushes for things like medical homes, the notion that an individual is signed uh, a particular provider whose responsibility it is to try to coordinate care across various providers. Um, so there are a number of pieces like that. On the Medicare front, uh, one thing the Affordable Care do Act does also to try to reduce overall costs in the Medicare system is, and this has become very controversial in the presidential debates, is by reducing payments to insurers and some medical providers over time, it seeks to save about 760, uh, I want to get my, my figures right, 760 million or billion? Billion. billion? billion, yeah, you know, million, billion, it all runs together. <laughs> billion dollars from the Medicare system in order to extend the life of the Medicare system by 10 years. Now, I don't think that that's going to show up in terms of reduced provider availability for Medicare patients. Uh, conversely, I think it's an important thing to do to try to save Medicare. So there are some things in the act. Um, I think what also is going to occur is there's going to be a huge demand pull on medical providers because we're talking about moving some four, maybe as many as five million Californians into insurance that didn't have it before. That's going to place some real stresses on the system. There's no question. Hopefully it will help to reduce some of the cost shifting that's occurring as folks are getting emergency care, higher costs, we get them into we get them insurance, get them preventive care. But we, there's no question we have a shortage of primary care physicians. The Affordable Care Act helps to address that in part by funding more medical residencies for primary care physicians, but there's no question we have a long way to go in terms of making sure we have an adequate um, number of providers to provide for all of this. 
Great. Thank you, um, Commissioner Jones, for coming down and speaking with you, us tonight. And thank you to Antioch and also to the audience uh, for participating in this dialogue. Um, so I'm with the uh, Public Health Department. So we have 30, 35,000 patients in our system as part of the safety net, primarily the uninsured and also Medi-Cal and publicly insured patients. And along with all of us up here on the panel, we're certainly impacted by the uninsured and hopefully this helps to address that and so we try to coordinate as best we can and strategize but um, I think we do have a concern about the residually uninsured so at the end of the day and I know this won't happen in 2014 with the flip of a switch but a few years down the road but how many persons do you anticipate will still lack health insurance coverage in California and do you anticipate that the state will support these uninsured individuals or help the counties and local health systems in providing for their care? It's a great question. So um, one thing the Affordable Care Act does not do is provide health insurance for undocumented persons and I know the opponents have been running around saying it does but it doesn't. Now um, would that it did because those folks are still going to get care in clinics and hospital ERs and that cost is going to be shifted to all of us but those folks are not covered. Um, you know, I think the estimates vary. The, the, the um, data that we have available to us indicates about 7 million Californians uninsured. The hope is to get between 4 to 5 million insured. Um, there's some fuzziness on the number. Why? Because it depends on how people react in part to the penalties. Um, there is a penalty. If you, you're mandated to get the insurance, but if you don't, there's a tax penalty. And frankly, it was that tax penalty that allowed Chief Justice Roberts to decide to uphold the whole thing in a very uh, cleverly decided opinion. Uh, but in any rate, um, it, there's some uncertainty with regard to whether that penalty is high enough to actually get everyone to enter the insurance market. Um, and so that's why there's a little bit of fuzziness in the number. But there will be a significant uninsured population that will remain. Um, and it will regrettably fall on um, community health pro providers, counties. Um, and I don't see uh, the state creating some new program to assist them because the state's budget right now is, is in tatters. I think the best we can hope for is that the state will take advantage of the opportunity of that four to five million to ensure the 1.9 million who are Medi-Cal eligible under the Affordable Care Act. Um, which I think we should do because it's such a great deal for us. Although there is some trepidation in some parts of the state uh, uh, budget offices about that ultimate 10% share that the state has to pay in 2020. But it's still a good deal and we should take it up. Commissioner Jones, hi. It's great hi, to Ron. see you again. Thank you. Thanks uh, for coming to Santa Barbara. It's uh, great to have you here. And uh, you made, uh, this men made mention of this in your opening comments, but I want to thank you for your leadership on uh, the hospital fee. Uh, issue that, that is bringing really substantial money into California. Um, here at uh, Cottage, because we don't have a county hospital here and we have a, uh, we are a safety net hospital, right. we have an exceptionally high percentage of Medi-Cal patients at the hospital. Uh, that, the, the work that you did will result in about $15 million coming into Santa Barbara County um, and to Cottage to help care for those patients in the ER and, and, and elsewhere. So we really appreciate your leadership Thank there. You. Um, you mentioned cost shift several times, and um, I, I want to ask a question about the employer-sponsored uh, community and where that might be going, uh, in your opinion. The, um, the, the way that our system has been held together for many years <coughs> is, is the cost shift. And you mentioned one kind of cost <coughs> shift. The, the, the cost shift that takes place in hospitals is, as, as you know, one of paying for that uh, expensive, uh, uncompensated emergency patient by shifting that over to the private sector. And the way the hospitals have done that across the country is to get a higher percentage increase from the commercial insurance companies uh, in recognition of not only the uncompensated care, but the fact that the government programs that represent about two-thirds of our patients uh, don't pay for the full cost of care. So in California, part of the reason that the hospital fee initiative was so important is that in California, um, hospitals uh, are paid at the, well, actually the amount of money that the state is able to put up is either 49th or 50 out of the 50 right. states. We compete with Nevada each yeah. year for that, that, yeah. uh, that title. And so because it's a federal matching fund, there just isn't enough money 
coming into the state or being put up by the state. And so at Cottage, we receive from the Medi-Cal program about 50% of the cost of care. And for the Medicare program, we receive about 72% of the cost of care. And that represents, with, with the uh, uh, other governmental programs, it represents two-thirds two -thirds of our patients. So it means that we need to shift that over to the private sector. And what started off in the mid-60s when these entitlement programs began as, as a fairly level playing field has evolved to a field where, where the, the employers in our community and the, those who buy pay premiums for themselves on individual plans are paying substantially more than the cost of care. So the, uh, that's a long background on the question, but the, the, but the question is because that's what makes our system work is that, that system, and, and we all think it's not sustainable, but what, what do you think once the, once the exchanges are up and running and there are, the, the goal is met of having affordable options for individuals. What do you think the response of the employer community is going to be? Are they going to continue to provide commercial insurance for employees, or are they going to see an alternative and of business necessity uh, no longer provide that? And, and, and if so, how will we continue to pay for, for the cost of medicine? So that's a great question. So um, I think it's going to depend. I think every employer is going to do an economic calculus and take a look at the penalties that they would otherwise pay if they don't continue to provide insurance versus just saying, look, we're not going to provide it and you can go buy it in the exchange. Now, the belief is that um, the majority of the business community will look at that and continue to provide health insurance. Um, and it's not just the economic calculus, it's also some ability to control it. Uh, and to better provide for one employees, particularly national employers who are uh, looking at this question across the whole nation and would be faced with different exchanges, potentially providing different levels of, of in insurance and different levels of care behind that state by state. So I think the belief is that the majority will stick with it. I don't know that there's been an analysis to indicate what percentage won't. Um, it is worrisome because uh, if uh, a large percentage decide to walk away and those people end up in the exchange, while they can get insurance in the exchange, it raises additional challenges for the exchange. On the cost shift issue, um, I think there, there are a couple points I want to make. N number one is the hope is that by getting more of the uninsured or underinsured insured, that there'll be less cost shifting. Now that doesn't mean that uh, that doesn't solve the problem of the Medicare or Medi-Cal underpayment to hospitals and other providers, but as to others that you're having to carry through charity care who are either uninsured completely or in some cases underinsured, these are people with junk insurance who, as it turns out, when they present at the hospital, their insurance really doesn't cover much at all, that those people will now be insured and so you won't be faced with having to eat those costs and you'll have, frankly, a larger pool of people that are insured to which to shift costs to. And that's uh, probably uh, not something that's affirmatively argued, you know, in many fora, but I'm just going to point it out. Um, and so it doesn't, it doesn't solve the, the issue, though, that, that's also within your question about the underpayment on, with regard to Medicare and Medi Medi-Cal. Now, Medi-Cal, you know, we just get the short end of the stick in California. And, and a lot of it has to do with the historical origin of the Medicaid, Medi-Cal program. It was established in the Johnson administration at the same time that Johnson signed the Medicare Act or thereabouts. At that time, California was getting huge defense subsidies. And so there was a rough justice. We were getting a lot of defense uh, money. And so they came up with a formula for Medicaid that basically took the state's GNP, divided it by its population, and came up with like a per capita wealth figure, and then allocated the federal participation in Medicaid accordingly. So if you're a poor state, nice places like, I don't know, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, poor relatively speaking, not poor in topography, scenery, the kindness of the people, the culinary <laughs> offerings, or anything like that. Um, I don't want to offend anybody who's from this place. Uh, but you're probably happier to be here. Uh, but, but in any event, if you're a poor state, you get a larger federal participation in the Medicaid program. Um, whereas if you're California, we get the lowest federal share of participation in the Medicaid program because you take our GNP and divide it by our population and we look like we're really wealthy when in fact we've got significant distribution of poor people here. Um, and so there have been repeated efforts to try to 
change that formula, but it turns out, you know, we just have two U.S. senators and the rest of everybody else is 98 and we always lose, except once, which we took advantage of, Ron and I and others, uh, when the um, Economic Recovery and Stimulus Act uh, was signed, the, one of the first bills after the Lilly Ledbetter bill that the president signed, um, that gave states the chance to participate with a much higher percentage of federal participation in Medicaid. But the catch was you had to come up with your state match. The answer was the bill that we worked on with the Hospital Association in Ron, which collected a fee from hospitals, used that as the state match, pulled down the bigger federal money. The fee and the, and the, and the uh, new federal dollars went back to the hospitals and higher reimbursements for Medicaid. And we've been able to utilize that for the past couple of years to improve things. It doesn't totally solve the problem, but it's helped, helped to improve it. Um, you know, I would like to see California get a better deal on Medicaid generally. I just don't, I don't think that's going to happen. And then what happens is because the state itself is broke, our ability to pay that higher state match is, is, is limited. And so we do things like we cut adult dental and we cut mental health services because we're so broke. So that's sort of the cycle we're in. Now, you know, the Affordable Care Act gives us some ability to get out of that with, these, with, with this new cohort of folks, which I think is something we should take advantage of. These, this 1.9 million people that we think will be eligible, we know will be eligible for Medi-Cal and will get 100% federal share. That's a, that's a good deal. That will help, that will help a lot. Um, so, uh, some partial relief, but not complete relief for the problems that the hospitals are facing. Great. Well, first of all, I am here personally <coughs> to sing the praises of uh, Cottage ER for my great <laughs> oh, man. treatment that I received four and a half weeks ago. <laughs> you are walking, you're a walking billboard for the hospital. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner, for being here today. And uh, it's so great for me to be among my colleagues here, great supporter of Santa Barbara Neighborhood Clinic's Cottage Health System. I don't know what we would do without you. And our great partner with the Public Health Department. And Sansom, oh my gosh, hundreds of thousands of referral, I should say specialty services for our patients that, I mean, I don't know what we would do without the work that you folks do. And also Antioch uh, has been supplying us with top-notch, wonderful interns for our behavioral health program for the last three years, I think. And uh, so, so that's great. And I, um, so here we are at the neighborhood clinics, and I know at, at public health and other places too, saying to ourselves, hmm, what should we be doing to get ready for January 2014? What should we, we should be doing something. What should we be doing? Well, we don't know this and we don't know that. And there's so many things that we don't know. Let's make a list of all the things we don't know. And yet we still need to move forward uh, to get ready, ready uh, with what we think we might know. And so, for example, for us, we're thinking, SINCAL has said in our county, Santa Barbara County, um, beginning January 2014, there will be 25,000 um, additional people who will be newly eligible for Medi-Cal. And um, so let's just say 40%, you know, so we serve Goleta to Carpinteria, the neighborhood clinics does. And so if we say, well, 40% of those perhaps would be on the south coast. Um, hmm, I wonder how many of those will be coming knocking on our doors and what about this thing that people are talking about called pent-up demand. I'm wondering what you think about that. And uh, so I guess my question is, if you were in my place, our place, what would you say that we should be doing to get ready? So that's the first part. And um, the second part is what role, sort of in a bigger um, picture, what role do you think community clinics will be playing in the ACA? Okay. Are you an FQHC or an FQHC lookalike? We are uh, an FQHC by virtue of being a subgrantee of the public health, county public health. Wonderful. Okay, yeah, right. So federally qualified health centers. So under the Medi-Cal program, and, and there are folks far more expert on this, uh, on this panel than I am, but there, there's a, uh, a designation called federal quali uh, Federally Qualified Health Center or Federally Qualified Health Center Lookalike. And the, the bottom line is you get a higher Medicaid reimbursement if you're one of those. And so what I encourage clinics to do is either become FQHC designated or FQHC lookalikes, or as, as you've done, bring yourself under the umbrella of someone that is, so that um, in an ideal world you can enjoy a higher reimbursement. So it sounds like you're, you've already done that and you're taking advantage of that. So that's great. Um, second, yes, there's going to be um, an expansion of the Medi-Cal population. The real challenge for, 
for medical providers and for clinics um, is that the Medi-Cal reimbursement, notwithstanding, uh, well, I think because of what I've just said, uh, still is lower than is necessary to cover uh, primary care physicians and other specialist costs. And so it's a real burden on physicians to take those patients, and I'm sure you have uh, some folks that are um, very mission oriented that are part of your clinic and that you know like uh, legal aid lawyers in the legal context decided to you know make one tenth of what they used to make or could make in the private sector you probably have physicians and others like that but not everybody can do that or is able or willing to do that so that's a real challenge I mean it is a real challenge I mean not only is there a shortage of primary care physicians generally but the the reimbursements for Medi-Cal are such that you know, it's going to continue to be a challenge to try to induce people to, to do this. So I wish I had a, a great answer to that. I mean, the Affordable Care Act provides uh, some funding for medical residencies to bring more primary care physicians in. There are some programs that defray uh, medical school loans if you agree to serve in an area that's a rural or underserved urban area. Um, my guess is part of your service area would probably fall within that designation. So there are some opportunities. Um, and it sounds like you've got partnerships, you know, throughout the system to try to to try to um, bridge uh, some of these gaps. But there there aren't easy solutions on that one, unfortunately. Um, it's going to be a challenge. I know it's going to be a challenge for you. Now, what's the role for community clinics? I think we need them. I think we got to be careful that with all you know. One thing that's happening under the Affordable Care Act is there's a lot of consolidation going on. There are um, uh, hospitals that are applying to be HMOs. There are hospitals that are acquiring physicians groups. There are physician groups that are acquiring each other. There, there's all this consolidation going on, and and some of that's being driven by the Affordable Care Act under the rubric of um, if things are more coordinated and consolidated, there's greater efficiency. There's a flip side to that, though, which is that sometimes with consolidation also can come uh, market dominance and the ability to price in ways that aren't entirely in the best interest of consumers and businesses. And so it's just something we need to be aware of. Um, I'll give you, for instance, there's a, a huge differential in hospital pricing between Northern and Southern California. I think the last report I read indicated that there's a 50% surcharge on hospital bills generally on average in Northern California versus Southern California. Now, you know, you scratch your head and say, why? I mean, it's, I mean those are nice hospitals up there, but they're not better than the one you have here. And so a part of it is because of, of market dominance and market position of some of those hospitals that are able to charge a surcharge. And in fact, you know, without naming any names, I mean, it got to the point where CalPERS decided, hey, look, one particular hospital chain, you know, you guys are just too expensive. We're no longer going to contract with HMOs or health insurers that have you in their network because we can't afford your hospital bills. So while there is, there is benefits to, to greater coordination and, and, and greater um, administrative cost reductions and, and greater efficiencies, there's also a flip side to consolidation I think we just need to be attentive to as, as regulators and um, as, as people who care about the, about the system. I, I don't want the community clinics to be squeezed out is where I'm going with that. I think they have an important role. I think that um, much as I'm sure you've done here locally where you have partnerships with the major hospital system and physician groups and the public health system, um, I think it's absolutely essential that we don't allow the community clinics to be squeezed out by all this because they play a critically important role. They can reach some patients due to location or due to cultural uh, affinities in ways that other providers can't, no, no criticism of other providers, but they're just better suited in some ways. And so I want us to do everything we can to keep them as a part of the system. And I, I, I understand that, you know, you've got a very robust set of partnerships here, and I applaud you for that. We uh, are probably going to have some questions from the audience. Um, and you've been given three by five turns. We've passed them down to the staff. And what you might not know that there is an adjacent room that's full with other people who are watching the proceedings. So um, as we're passing the questions down, um, I, I, uh, one question came up that um, need me to talk to the mic. Um, sorry. Um, Cindy, you suggested, and I think I am concerned, and so are the students at Antioch who do a good deal of the mental health providing where are the mental health issues going to be in the uh, food chain here in uh, the new ACA um, and, uh, and people with drug and alcohol issues because uh, we, we do a lot of uh, 
service providing in this community in that area and and they're always sort of the forgotten the forgotten ones so so i'll take the top level and then i'll defer to someone with greater expertise than me so at the at the 20,000 foot level the the federal affordable care act requires essentially each state to define an essential health benefits floor below which health insurance and HMO product cannot go and it sets forth categories of coverage and mental health coverage is one of those and there's also something called the Federal Mental Health Parity Act and the State Mental Health Parity Act that requires if, if a health insurer HMO uh, is providing um, certain physical treatments for folks that they don't discriminate against those that have uh, mental uh, health issues in the provision of care. Um, there's a lot of room for interpretation though and let me give you one example that is very near and dear to my heart uh, to illustrate this autistic kids so uh, it turns out um, that uh, many of the health insurers and in HMOs if not all of them uh, up until about last year uh, were denying autistic kids the medically indicated treatment for autistic kids which is called behavioral therapy um, and they were denying it on the grounds that it was educational not medical despite a whole raft of medical literature that indicates that it is medical and it's absolutely essential to make sure that autistic kids have the ability to be successful uh, both as kids and teenagers and in later life and so when I got into office I took a look at this <clears throat> and discovered these denials and we began overturning at the Department of Insurance these denials uh, based on an independent medical review by medical practitioners that were reviewing these denials and in about 30 of 30 cases where the health insurer had denied behavioral treatment we overturned it and then I issued a notice to all the health insurers saying hey, knock it off we've got a body of precedents that indicate that you have to you have to provide this treatment and then we began enforcement actions against the health insurers that continued now um, we had a divergence of views on this initially between our agency and the Department of Managed Healthcare, which regulates HMOs. Thankfully, there became a convergence of views over time, um, and they also took the same position ultimately with HMOs. And part of that was just the transition between the Schwarzenegger administration leadership of DMHC and the new Brown administration leadership. Once Jerry got his own person in there, they brought themselves to where we were on this and insisted the same thing of HMOs. But I cite this to you as an example where interpretation really matters and and having um, a regulator uh, interpreting these questions in a, in a thoughtful way in a way that is consistent with medical literature um, is is really important um, and there's going to be a host of questions like this that we're going to be faced with as we move forward with Im implementation uh, particularly as it relates to mental health coverage and if there's someone else who wants to talk about that I'll, I'll yes sir um, does that uh, autism coverage apply on the Medi-Cal program as well? So great question. So um, I don't regulate Medi-Cal as much as I'd like to. Um, and the short answer is no. And because what happened was as a result of the regulatory work that, that my department did, um, we created an opening for Senator Steinberg, who also cares per passionately about autism as well, to introduce legislation and to move legislation that um, put in state law a further clarification that behavioral treatment needs to be covered but to get that bill through the legislature given the state's fiscal condition uh, he was forced to take that requirement out of the Medi-Cal program so that particular I mean, the Mental Health Parity Act still provide covers both and and I would argue under the Mental Health Parity Act Medi-Cal should still be providing this but in the clarifying bill that the senator ran Medi-Cal was pulled out of the bill so it's not specifically called for so where does that leave us you know, I think that if if you're a physician with a Medi-Cal uh, patient who is autistic um, and Medi-Cal de denies you behavioral therapy I believe that you have an argument under the Mental Health Parity Act that that treatment should be provided uh, but you don't under Senator Steinberg's legislation because he had to pull that out in order to get the in order to get the bill through. Um, I saw Elaine Schneider, the mayor of Santa Barbara, here as well, and I want to thank her for coming too and, and, and acknowledge and recognize her leadership also. It's great to see you. Okay, we've had a flood of questions come come in, and I'm going to swing around here. Um, one question asks, and this could be for anybody on the panel: How do we deal with the high cost of dying? 
Yeah. Actually, Santa Barbara is very good at, th at this. Uh, I would encourage any of you who are interested to go to the Dartmouth Healthcare Atlas, which is a fascinating site where you can type in different counties in the United States and you can see the cost that Medicare spends on a whole number of uh, topics, one of which is the cost of care in the last six months of life which is a very important subject because everyone has the same outcome, right? So it's really a way of comparing apples to apples. And actually, Santa Barbara is uh, remarkably good in that metric uh, because we have a very active hospice program, we have a very el uh, educated community, and we have uh, good providers and a good hospital system that uh, all work together uh, to do that. But it, it is a significant issue um, Every, everywhere, uh, you know, and technology is driving that. There are very expensive developments, uh, drugs that cost $100,000 to extend life for three months. And that's very, you know, it's very difficult to understand how, how to adjudicate uh, if, if that's a good use of society resources. But in general, Santa Barbara does very well at this. Um, uh, that, that's uh, absolutely true. That Dartmouth study, you should really check it out. It, it is, uh, it, uh, I think, really makes us proud, particularly of our, of our physicians and medical community and the relationships with the palliative care program that we have at the hospital, with uh, VNA and hospice and hospice of Santa Barbara. We're really fortunate to have those. Uh, I would just add that there's a really interesting uh, uh, slide that we call the hockey stick slide that shows the um, cost per capita compared with five other developed nations, uh, United States, Spain, UK, I forgot the other two or three. But what it shows is that, that uh, actually in the very early years of our life, we actually are a little bit cheaper than one or two of the others per capita. And then we, we run in parallel. As you get to 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, the US healthcare system is just slightly more expensive than five other developed nations. When we turn 58, we flip a switch. And we start using our health care services to the point where these five, from your view, these five or six countries all run a little, it's a little bit more expensive as we age. And then at age 58, the US just goes almost straight up. And I, um, I, I don't know, David, if you have any comments on this from your uh, familiarity with uh, what's going on nationally, but. The, uh, it seems that every time we try to have a conversation about this, it becomes you know, death panels and things of that nature. And so uh, I just wonder if there's is there any hope for having a, a rational social conversation about this topic. I think it's really hard. Um, and I was, before, you, before you went there, Ron, I was going to say, and there are no death panels in the Affordable Care Act, and there aren't. Um, and all, all there is is there's an Institute of Medicine panel that's looking at the cost efficacy of certain treatments, you know, based on evidence-based, which, which became, you know, demagogued into a death panel, even though it's not that. So I, I think the Affordable Care Act begins to, to tentatively have that conversation, but there was such an uproar about even that that, you know, I think we've got to kind of feel our way through that because it, it you know, I think there's progress there in having that panel, may, and those are just recommendations, by the way, um, but it's clear that we need to do a lot more soul searching and thinking about it, because it's a huge cost driver in the system. It really is, and it's a, it's a, it's a problem. I know each and every one of you as medical providers, I mean, the, it's a huge, huge cost driver in the system. Yeah, I think I'd like to say that one of, one of the real important ways we can address that as sort of a community and as our expectations and individuals is by having those end of life discussions at a very early age, uh, at very early stage in terms of advanced directives. Um, having those conversations with providers, with, providers don't like talking about that themselves a lot of the time. Um, having those discussions with family members about what people really want in, in, at the end of life period. Um, there have been a number of research studies that have shown in communities where this has really been pushed that that cost of end-of-life care has really gone down and it's because of the education and awareness and uh, discussion about advanced directives. Very good. 
uh, someone, a couple of people asked, what might a local accountable care organization and ACO look like for Santa Barbara and who might lead that effort? So forgive me, I don't know if Santa Barbara was awarded an ACO grant or not, but, but I, I would then defer to you to talk about some of the partnerships that you've developed here that are you know, sort of ACO-like. Uh, well, Medicare is an interesting story. Uh, Medicare, by analogy, it's as if they suddenly said exercise is important, but what they said is we're going to reward you by how much time you shave off your mile run, okay? So Santa Barbara, in that analogy, is already running six-minute miles, and places in Texas are running 14-minute miles, and frankly, I've never run a mile. So. <laughs> <laughs> there are these huge opportunities in Medicare ACOs in places like that because with any injection of rationality you can have huge savings. Santa Barbara is challenging from a Medicare ACO standpoint because it's harder to get your time off when you've already been running for a long time. Um, Santa Barbara, as I mentioned before, if you look at the Dartmouth Atlas, you can really see this. Uh, but like our costs, I think they were like $8,700 a year for Medicare. And places in Texas are 15000 So it's a lot harder to save. On commercial, non-Medicare products, then there will be opportunities uh, probably to form ACOs. They, they are fundamentally very similar to HMOs, but without a lot of the politically charged attributes of, of, of uh, HMOs. Um, uh, just, I think we have the kind of a community where we could and should take advantage of, of accountable care. I agree with Dr. Ansehoff that, that to accept 95% of what Medicare paid to our community and expect to get it less than that is, uh, is almost impossible and it's just not enough of an incentive for local providers to work together to take less money on the hopes that we could cost even less than that. Having said that, just you look at our geography and the partnerships that we enjoy with the clinics, with Sansom, the hospitals, public health, uh, our independent uh, provider community and there is an opportunity here for us to, to, to work together to partner with an insurance company to, to, to do it better. And so um, to me, that's one of the, the um, uh, challenges that the AACA puts out there is not just to take the Medicare challenge, but to, to partner together. And, and there are a lot of things going on in that particular area. We're developing a health information exchange uh, where we will be able to exchange information uh, uh, across providers. That's going to be terrific for patient safety, and it may be the hub of a wheel that could help us get at the cost curve as well. I'm going to throw another question at you, Ron, because uh, someone asks, if Medicare reimbursements are cut drastically with Cottage, uh, will Cottage keep taking Medicare patients? Is yes. That... <laughs> okay. Um, I can expand, but <laughs> <laughs> no, they'll fit yeah, on the No, plate. I think so you, we, wanna... you know. Part, well, part of the um, uh, just part of the responsibility of being the sole provider of acute hospital services is that we're going to make sure that we do everything we can to have to to for all the communities to access hospital services. So I can't imagine uh, the hospital taking a position that they would not accept Medicare. I just can't even imagine that. We wouldn't, uh, we couldn't say that we were fulfilling our mission. We wouldn't be a community hospital. Uh, and uh, there, there's never even been a conversation about that. I can't imagine that that would ever happen. Um, uh, I, I thought the question might be what will, if Medicare cuts the hospital payment, what will be the, re the reaction in, in, at the hospital or in the community. And uh, I think that, that uh, first of all, that's what we expect to happen. Uh, the um, uh, hospitals accepted, uh, I believe, $550 billion in Medicare cuts uh, a as the hospital industry, su industry supported the ACA because of all the good things that it's going to do. But the fact remains that there's going to be less money to spend for hospitals, for physicians, we're, we're going to see less money going into healthcare because the, the path that we're on simply isn't sustainable. 
So in the short term, the hospital's reaction uh, and others has been to just extend that cost shift over. But I think that that particular approach is not going to work very much longer. And I appreciate your pointing out that the American Hospital Association participated in those negotiations. And, and um, I think the Obama administration has made clear that what they're talking about going forward is a um, decrease in the rate of increase of Medicare. So not an absolute reduction in Medicare reimbursements that hospitals are getting currently, but a decrease in the r rate of increase. Although, as, you know, as Ron pointed out, I mean, the current rate already is below what their, what their actual costs are. But um, no one is talking about an absolute decrease, uh, to my understanding, in, in Medicare. And what's interesting is that this, although this issue has become a big talking point in the national presidential debate, the Ryan budget had this same $760 billion savings in it that the administration has included in its budget and in the Affordable Care Act. So there's a lot of um, kind of back and forth going on about this, but frankly, uh, both parties agreed to include this, and it was negotiated out with the um, hospitals nationwide, as well as the health insurers who take a, a haircut on this too um, in the, in the Medi uh, Medicare supplement policies. I, I'd just like to add on, on the Medi-Cal and rate issue is that um, whether it's the uninsured or Medi-Cal, it's not just a hospital issue or a health department issue. We're all part of the same county system. And so I think one of the goals of the Affordable Care Act is that when these individuals who are currently uninsured move over to Medi-Cal or into the exchange, they'll have this comprehensive health insurance. And once we get through the pent-up demand, I think the, the hope is that by getting access to preventive care and regular checkups and medications, that they're not going to delay care and end up costing the hospitals and emergency rooms even more because of advanced levels of disease. Uh, so that's another way that I think as a system we're going to try to work together within the public health department. We're doing things internally to try to keep people out of the hospitals by moving to a new model of care called patient-centered medical home, by going to electronic health records, better coordination with the other community clinics, and better chronic disease management. I think I'm going to bring the discussion to a close on that note, Dr. Wada, because I'm hoping that everybody is going to their physician annually and taking their medications properly and feeling a sense of gratitude for the extraordinary leadership that we have in this community, providing health care and working th so beautifully together. This has been a wonderful conversation, and I want to thank Commissioner Jones for coming here. He has to get on a plane and fly back to, where's that place, Sacramento? Sacramento. Okay. Uh, a long drive to a place called Burbank. Um, and I want to thank the extraordinary uh, n a group of people who have turned out tonight. I, I know many of you who are also leaders in the healthcare profession and are doing great work on a day-to-day -day basis. This is the first of this year's uh, trustee fora, in, is it fora or forums, at Antioch University. The next one we hope to do will be on immigration policy. Uh, basing our conversation on a case that is working its way up to California Supreme Court of a young man who came to this country when he was a young boy and is not uh, legal and he's gone all the way through law school and he's taken the bar successfully and he may not be permitted to practice because he's not a legal citizen. So right, wrong, let's have a conversation when we see you next. Please join us for the next trustee forum and thank you all of you for being here. It's been a fantastic <laughs> conversation. Really amazing. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Really wonderful. Really